Welcome to the Shipping Podcast, where I meet interesting maritime professionals, sharing their passion for the shipping industry and their everyday job. I am your host. My name is Lena Gosberg. Hello, Shipping Podcast lovers. This is episode 84, and I will be introducing you to an old friend of mine. I think you maybe can be able to calculate the age of us, not only by listening to the episode, but when I tell you that we met in the early 90s, when we were both young to the industry and very ambitious. We were colleagues, Jim Padden, who you are going to listen to today. He was in Oslo and I was in Gothenburg. And I went to Oslo to do some internal work for the company that we worked for at that time. I hadn't seen Jim in 25 years or something like that until recently when we went to an anniversary celebration of that company that we worked for. And then I found out that he has become a hotshot in the marine insurance business. So... What better than to try and introduce you to marine insurance through my very good old friend, Jim Padden. I met Jim when I was in Oslo on October the 24th. And this is our chat. Welcome to the Shipping Podcast. Could you please introduce yourself? Yes, certainly. My name is Jim Padden. Uh, I'm an insurance broker, have been for all of my career which spans back just over 30 years. As you can hear, I'm I'm an Englishman, but I've spent most of my life working out of the Nordics, in particular Oslo in Norway. So how did you come in contact with shipping? What made you start in this industry? That's a good question. So if I go back to when I was a teenager, I guess like most teenagers, I didn't know what I was going to do. I was, uh, we're going back now to the mid-1980s, and I really didn't understand the world. I didn't understand business. I had no idea what I was going to do. And my great uncle was an underwriter at Lloyd's of London, uh, a marine underwriter. And he said to me over one of our family dinners, well, you know, why don't you come up to Lloyd's, uh, spend a couple of days in the centre of London and see what I do and see whether that's something you may be interested in. So I went up for a couple of days. I sat on the box um, in the old Lloyd's building, for those that know insurance. Uh, And I watched a mass of people. And I, of course, at that stage, I didn't understand the the roles that they played come in and out. And the the network of people was phenomenal. And again, back in, in the 1980s, all business was done face to face. It wasn't, there was not so much electronic trading going on. And I thoroughly enjoyed the atmosphere in there, Lloyd's building, the networking of people. Uh, it, was, it was a phenomenal atmosphere back then. So uh, I got a lot of knowledge during that two-day trip and I became very excited about working in some sort of trading market. So I, uh, I went home and my uncle called me and he said, so did you enjoy it? And I said, absolutely phenomenal. I loved every minute of it. And, he's, and of course, back in those days, it was a little bit more who you knew rather than what you know. And he said, well, there's a couple of people who have asked about you. Would you, would you like to come up and, and take some interviews? Which I very gratefully said yes to. And that's where it all started. I didn't know that about you. <laughs> yes, yeah. It's in the family. In fact, my, my cousin works in the industry and I had another cousin who used to work in the industry. So the family joke is that it's a, insurance is a cottage industry. Because <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we can tell our audience that we have met before. We have, absolutely. Long time ago. It was, it was. We were colleagues. Yes, we were. And I think that goes back to the early 1990s. Yes. Uh, which is when I came across to, to, to Norway. So my, my career actually started back in uh, 85, 86. I was, uh, went into one of the marine brokers in London as a trainee to learn the basics of insurance. And after two years, I felt as though I needed to move on and learn a little bit more. 
So I moved to, a, to another broker, a bigger broker who I now work for. And I moved over to the, to the marine offshore world of insurance. Uh, and after two years in that London office, they asked me whether I'd like to come and experience the Nordic market. So uh, I ended up in Oslo and that's where we first met as we were working for the same company. Yes. Yeah. And I have always said that people do not understand what we do as uh, in insurance, I mean in the marine insurance, because we need to know a lot about our customers. Absolutely. I think, you know, when people think about insurance, they think about their experience with insurance, whether it's buying insurance for their car, their house, maybe it's their, their uh, personal insurances. Uh, but of course, marine insurance is very, very different from that. I think the differences really go from the fact that we need a lot more insurance for a ship than you do a house or a car. Um, you need more insurance companies to take on that risk. Um, the technicalities of the insurance policy, they're not standard. Again, car insurance tends to be standard in whichever country you're buying it, whereas marine insurance tends to be more tailor-made to each and every shipping company. So yes, there are big differences from, from the man on the streets knowledge of insurance. And also, I think I always ended up telling people that I was an insurance buyer when I was the insurance broker. Yes. Because people also tend to see us, or well, I am not anymore, but to see insurance brokers as sellers of insurance. That's correct. I think, again, I mean, even people in the industry sometimes get a little bit confused as to the role of the broker. So the insurance market are, of course, the sellers of insurance. The insurance broker is the agent on behalf of the ship owner. So we sit on their side of the, uh, the, the, ta the negotiations table and we try and negotiate the best deal on behalf of shipping companies. So the broker acts on behalf of the ship owner and not on behalf of the ship, uh, sorry, the, the insurance market. Mm. Which means that you always have to know a lot about shipping companies and, and all of their how they work and uh, their policies for everything from crewing to maintenance and to everything else. Absolutely. So I think, you know, one of the one of the ways that the insurance broking industry has developed over the last 25 years or so is that we've become more risk advisors to shipping companies rather than just, well, you have a a hull of machinery policy or a P&I policy, let us go and place that into the market. We now uh, act as advisors to shipping companies to, to look at their risk tolerance, how much risk can they take on financially. So we have to have an understanding of their financial performance over the, the last four, five, six years. We have to look at things like maintenance programs to be able to understand and differentiate one shipping company against another shipping company so that we are in the best position to negotiate the best insurance terms uh, with the insurance market. So that, that there's a lot of detail that goes on within the broker industry that maybe people wouldn't first recognize. Yeah, because uh, the big shipping companies usually have a, an insurance department and they know a lot about the things that you know and ask them about. They do. But if there is, if there is a small ship owner, Maybe they do not have that knowledge in-house, so they can also look to you for advice. Absolutely. In particular, in terms of risk, I mean, again, if you look at the shipping industry, if you look at uh, unmanned shipping that, that is coming in the future, for example, you know, there's a lot of technological changes, which, which means that the insurance industry will need to refocus on, on these technological developments and try and understand how that risk exposure differs than a traditional shipping operation. So, so we do, do have to go into the different layers of a shipping company. A colleague of mine was ex explaining to one of our younger colleagues the other day how a shipping company is like an onion. There are so many different layers to a shipping company that makes up the whole, because whether it be um, operations, 
maintenance, whether it may be crewing and crewing agencies. There are just many, many different facets to shipping which one wouldn't see from the outside. So there are very many different jobs within shipping companies. Uh, and I think that's very exciting. There's really two things that's kept me in this industry for, for such a long time. One of them is the fact that I learn something new every day. There's always changes going on. The second thing is the networking possibilities. The amount of people that I meet within our clients' organizations, within the insurance markets, and all of the other different industries around marine insurance, the legal profession, the loss adjust adjusting profession, it goes on and on and on. And I will never meet all of the people I would like to meet in the, uh, in the global shipping industry. You never meet a dull person because no. everyone has a personality. Absolutely. And everyone has a story. Yes. And that's the nice thing, right? So you can spend hours upon hours, if you ever have the time, talking with many, many different people. So how has the marine insurance market from, from the other side changed during since I left? <laughs> yes, absolutely. How has it changed? So at the moment, the insurance market is a, is a, is a flush with money. There's, um, when, when you look at what's happened since the 2007, 2008 financial crisis, which we all knew took a, a large chunk out of the shipping market. You know, global trade, approximately 90% of that is done by ship. And when the financial crisis hit, shipping took one of the biggest hits because there was a lot less cargo being traded around the, the globe and therefore there was less sh shipping operations going on. What's happened since is that we've not seen the financial markets bounce back um, too quickly. So investors look for the best returns that they can get on an annual basis. And over the last sort of 10 years, insurance has been a very, very good bet for investors. So investors have been putting a lot of money into the insurance markets. And when there's more money into the insurance markets, it means prices get pushed down because there's more competition for the amount of business that's there. So in terms of premium rates, then we see that they've reduced dramatically over the last 10 years or so. We've still got that situation where there's many, many, many insurance companies offering the same sort of marine insurance products. We see that there are a lot of local insurers now fighting for the business from their own countries. So the big international markets like London are under attack from local markets in whether it be Singapore, whether it be India or China. So yeah, the, the insurance markets have become a lot more competitive over the last 10 years than they ever were before, which is great for the shipping companies. Yeah, so we are there again. <laughs> we're, we're back there we're again. We're back there again. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And yeah. the market looks at each other and they, they wonder when a turn may come. And of course, we're now in October 2017 and we've had some real big natural catastrophes around the globe over the last few months, in particular with the hurricanes in the Gulf of Mexico. We've seen in Mexico, we saw the earthquake. We've had the, uh, the fires up in Northern California, which is uh, ruining the wine industry up there, of course. And, and these uh, catastrophes will take billions of dollars out of the insurance industry. Uh, and right now we're looking at whether that's just going to affect results for insurers or in fact, whether it will affect the capital that's, that's in the insurance market. There's some debate in the insurance market at the moment what effect it will have. Some of the larger insurers are saying that it's going to have very little effect. Uh, we're seeing other reinsurers saying that prices will have to go up in 2018. But where we are today, it's, it's still a lot of debate around that and no certainty as to how the market will develop. Mm, interesting. But you have been you have had different hats on within your organization. I have. Yes, that's so when, right. when we met, you were an expert on offshore and, and things right. like that. Absolutely. So, so my own personal career developed in a way that I had never imagined that it would. And I think that's one of the nice things about the insurance industry. You never know what's around the next corner. 
there's a lot of development going on, there's, there's opportunities that do arise, maybe not at the time you want them to arise, but they do arise at some stage. So as an oil and gas broker in the early 1990s, I obviously followed the market, worked in, in the market, and the market changed somewhat in the beginning of the 1990s. It hardened, prices went up. Uh, it was more difficult to get insurers to commit to some of our clients. My primary role at the time, working for such a large insurance broker, was to get the best deal for our international clients in the Scandinavian insurance market. Uh, that meant that the business was being produced by Marsh offices across the globe and being sent to me to get the best deal possible. We call that wholesale broking in our industry because you don't have direct contact with the clients. You tend to gain your business from colleagues. In the late 1990s, uh, our focus changed somewhat to be able to try and produce our own business in the Scandinavian uh, territories. And we took some time before we were really successful at that. In 2006, I was given the opportunity to lead the energy team here in the Nordics. We were quite small at the time. I think we, we were maybe the fourth largest broker with a small market share. So we knew we had to do something a little bit different and we changed our strategy. We became a little bit more aggressive towards the market. And of course, as an insurance broker, when you're negotiating on behalf of your clients, your clients want to see you being more aggressive. And we grew our, our energy business quite rapidly in the latter 2000. So 2000 to, uh, 2008 through to 2010, we grew quite rapidly. That meant that our reputation got better uh, in the market. It meant that I was able to attract the best talent to Marsh. And, and we, we went from being six individuals to 20 individuals in a, in a rather short space of time because we were the movers and the shakers within uh, the Scandinavian oil and gas market. A lot of, uh, a lot of good talent came to Marsh and we grew and we grew and we grew. And from there, I was asked to lead Marsh in Norway. I became the CEO, which was a very different role for me. This was then not just marine insurance or not just energy insurance. It was all sorts of general insurance. So my learning curve went uh, quite quickly uh, across general insurance. However, it was a very administrative role. And I felt as though I really wanted to get back to dealing more with clients on a daily basis. So talking to uh, certain individuals within Marsh, I came to the role that I have today. And that's one of the uh, true advantages of working for a large company. If the role that you have today doesn't quite suit you, there are a lot of opportunities within a large company. So today I'm global sales leader for our oil and gas business. Uh, when I say global, I mean global. I deal with every single country in the world that has uh, oil and gas business in it, which as you can imagine is pretty much every country. We have teams of people in those different countries who I help produce business. And, and that's a role that I've thoroughly enjoyed over the last two and a half years. It's, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I think uh, I said earlier on that two things keep me in this industry. One is learning something new every day. I'm certainly still doing that. And in terms of my networking, uh, it, it's massive. Uh, the, there are so many people out there working in so many different cultures, working in so many different conditions. It's a phenomenal job that I have at the moment because I get to experience all of this constantly. I know. I'm a bit jealous, but not really, because I have the same experience. And that is what I'm trying to, to get people to understand that that's, in a way, it's the shipping industry. Yes, it is. It's a global industry. It's a global industry. And shipping, shipping doesn't just occur on the sea. It occurs on the, on the land as well. Uh, logistics and transportation is a, is a big part of shipping. So those that actually work on the sea are probably in the minority of those that work in shipping uh, on the land. So 
So if you say offshore and energy market, what are you insuring? Is it rigs or is it, what is it? So in the oil and gas world, yes, it is. So we insure everything from the large North Sea platforms, platforms in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, you have these production rigs, the, the rigs that either float or are fixed to the seabed, and they produce oil and gas from the reservoirs below. So it must be a huge value in these big ones. Massive values. So we see the replacement cost on a like-for-like -like basis. We see values up to three and a half, four billion dollars. Oh my God. It's, they're, they're big insurance policies. But in addition to just the physical element, we also insure elements such as the cost of controlling a well. I think many people will remember the Deepwater Horizon accident that occurred in the Gulf of Mexico. So we insure the cost of regaining control of the well that was out of control. We ensure the re-drilling costs for that well. We ensure the cost of cleaning up seepage and pollution as well. Because of course, an, a, an accident like that causes a lot of damage to the environment. And it's very important for the oil company to clean up that cost um, as much as possible. Now, when we look at an accident like that, I think the latest figure I saw, BP announced that it cost them something like $40 billion. We don't have an insurance market that, that, that's that big. So unfortunately, in those scenarios, we find that insurance will only be able to take care of a certain part of that, that cost. $40 billion is, is, is a number that really doesn't make sense to you and I sitting here, Lena. It, it's, it's a lot of money and, and the insurance market is not that big unfortunately. So we ensure those production platforms. We also ensure the pipelines for the crude to reach the land and then maybe to a refinery. We ensure the refineries. We ensure anything that goes on around the offshore site. So it may be mobile drilling rigs. It may well be uh, the people on board the rigs. It may well be pipe laying vessels. Uh, so anything that occurs around uh, an oil and gas venture, we ensure that. And everyone says that the oil and offshore energy market has died, more or less, mm. because mm. of the financial pressure on it. Absolutely. So what we're seeing at the moment, so we all know that in uh, the third quarter 2014, the crude price came from a high of about $120 a barrel, which is what the oil companies were earning when they were selling their, their, their crude. And it came down over a 12 month period to about $30 a barrel. And you can imagine in any industry, when your top line, your revenue, your income goes from 120 down to 30, you're gonna to have to cut your costs pretty quickly. And we've seen that across the globe in the oil and gas industry. We've seen it to the extent that many, many tens of thousands of people have lost their jobs, unfortunately. We've seen that exploration budgets have been cut. That means the amount of money that oil companies are spending on trying to find new oil and gas fines is reduced dramatically. The one real positive that comes out of this is that those oil and gas companies that are still in, in good shape financially, it means they become leaner, they become a lot more efficient at what they're doing, but also they use time during this period to develop new technology, cheaper technology, but better technology to develop oil and gas fields. So again, when I said earlier on that I like learning things on a, on a daily basis, the amount of new technology that's coming into the oil and gas industry at the moment is wonderful. We are, we are now um, drilling holes from offshore rigs which are floating on the top of the water and the seabed doesn't start for maybe two kilometers down. You know, it's amazing feats that they can do that in a safe manner. 
We talked about Deepwater Horizon earlier on. There's not many Deepwater Horizon accidents that occur like that, but there are many, many wells that get drilled in very, very deep water at the moment. Mm. Fascinating. I think it's fascinating. It is. Yeah. So how do you see the future for shipping in general? As I said earlier on, about 90% of the of world trade happens uh, by ship. It's cheap. And that's why and you can you can transport in bulk. If you think about having to transport the same cargoes by aeroplane, it's going to cost a lot more. You can't take so much. Uh, there, are, there are many more restrictions. So I think that for shipping, there is a bright future. There is no doubt about it. I think that the industry has changed tremendously. I've just talked about the oil and the gas industry and how technology has changed. We're seeing the same in the in the uh, shipping industry as well. So yes, there is a very bright future for shipping in the in the future. I think that uh, world trade, of course, is going to uh, determine how quickly and how successful the shipping industry becomes in the near future. With an uptick in world trade, we will see businesses flourish in the shipping industry. What about the digitalization? Scary, isn't it? For, <laughs> for, for you and I, that's scary. <laughs> I am curious and, and I think it's great because Absolutely. I think it will change a lot. Oh, I think it will. Um, I mean, if you think about today how much we buy on the internet, how much you do yourself. I, um, I visited my bank the other day for the first time in years. Wow. Because I do everything on the internet. And I think it's going to be the same with, with shipping. One, one, of the, one of the dangers to digitalization is cyber attacks that we're seeing increase on a global basis. We've seen it recently with one of the large Nordic port and terminal operators have a cyber attack, which took their systems down for quite a period of time. And that costs business a lot of money. So I think that we will see that shipping companies will start spending a lot more money on protecting their digital assets. I think that's uh, going to be quite important for them because those attacks can come from anywhere in the world. A colleague of mine again described them as terrorist attacks. You could describe them as terrorist attacks, but traditionally we think of terrorist attacks as being terrorists in a physical location attacking your asset or your people there and then. This is a terrorist attack of a different nature. But it's not only shipping that is hit by that. No, it's not. And in fact, the, uh, the power industry has seen a lot of attacks in the US. The Ukraine was hit about three and a half years ago where they took out uh, the, the electrical network for, for quite some time. So every industry is uh, a target for cyber attacks. I think the ex-leader of the FBI described that there were two types of com companies in the world, those that know they've been attacked and those that don't know they've been attacked but have been attacked. Mm. Mm. But, I mean, every industry, every company in every industry will also be involved in this industry revolution 4.0, the, the digitalization. Absolutely. It's going to, I mean, everywhere. Yes. So we need to start thinking about, yeah, security. Yes. Safety, things like that. Oh, I think so. And I, I well, I, you know, industries come quite some way in protecting themselves. I think any large company whose business is dependent on the digital world already has in place a lot of protection. The problem is, of course, cyber attackers, they're smart people yeah. and they will continue to attack and they will break protection down. That's an industry within itself developing the attackers against the defenders. Yeah, yeah, you're right. But, but we also have a, we've got a new generation coming in. Absolutely. I th and I think that's, uh, that's very good news because I, I'm an optimist in life. I like to think there are more goodies out there than baddies. And I think that the new generation who are much more technology efficient than we are, their knowledge spans a lot further than yours and mine, will find that new industries will be created from the digitalization of our world. And, and, and that's, that's a very good thing. Yeah, I agree. And I think uh, we need to become more 
transparent and a bit more efficient on that side as well. And, and I mean, if you see, it used to be that uh, people in this industry worked until they died on their chair, more or yes, less. Yes. They worked until they were 75 and 80. But yes. a lot of people have now retired or are about to retire because they can't see the light in the tunnel. No, that's right. Well, I think I think that people's days change have changed over the last, let's say, twenty five years as as digitalization has taken hold. So, personally, for myself, it doesn't really matter whether I'm sitting here in the office, whether I'm on a plane or in a hotel or in another office across across the globe. I have access to my systems. I have access to the internet, uh, and I can work just as well from any particular location. Mm. And I think that will occur. So you're right. A while ago, it was that you, you worked till you were 70 years old in the same office with the same desk, the same chair. Now I think we've become a lot more flexible. We've become a lot more, what should I call it? Uh, we, we have the ability through digitalization to work from wherever. Mm. Yeah. And we are often looked upon as the Cinderella industry. Yes. No one knows about us. Yes. What can we do to change that, to become more visible? Another good question. I think that the younger generation probably look at the shipping industry as being an old man's industry. I would like to see shipping companies market themselves in universities. I would like to see the shipping industry be more on social media. I think that th th there's a trick being missed there for the shipping industry. I think any industry needs to attract young talent. And if we're able to attract young talent, then all of these things we've been talking about, the future of shipping, the digitalization, the threats that are out there, then we will get some very good young talent in to be able to protect the industry, grow the industry, and develop the industry. And I think that's happening to a large extent anyway. If you look at green shipping, you look at no crew ships, you, you look at concepts like that that, that that are pushing forward. This is because of young people rather than the old traditional ship owners who maybe have lost touch a little bit with today's world. In a way, also, I think that ship owners, they don't see themselves as the heroes that they are. No. They, they think, well, this is just my everyday job. That's right. But if they would tell, people would be, wow. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. If you, well, if you look at the size of the largest cargo ships in the world at the moment, they're phenomenal engineering feats, number one. Uh, but the fact that they can operate on the high seas the way they do, at such a low cost as well, compared to traditional cost, is, is quite incredible. So yes, within the industry, I think there's been some wonderful development. But that's not something that gets out to the man on the street. No. We have a tendency to talk to each other because we love our job and yes. we love the industry we are in. But we never tell anyone else. It's a lifestyle though, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yeah, shipping is a lifestyle, without a doubt. And I think that you can tell who's been in the shipping industry a long time by talking with them about a completely different subject. You understand who's in the shipping industry by the way they are, the way they talk. There are so many stories from the shipping industry. That's what makes up the colorful fabric that is that industry. Um, and I, and I, I think that uh, any young person joining the shipping industry today will be fascinated by the development within the industry, the history of the industry, and the bright future that it has. <laughs> <laughs> you like that? Oh, yes. <laughs> Who would you be interested in listening to in the shipping podcast? Who do you think I should meet the next? Good question. Who do I think you should meet next? I would like to hear a little bit more from the Asian market. I think um, whether it's shipping or whether it's another industry, what's going on in China at the moment is absolutely fascinating. So I'd like to hear the thoughts from the Chinese shipping industry as to where they think 
shipping is going, global shipping is going. So I got a challenge now. Now you've got a challenge. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jim. Thank you for taking the time. It was such a pleasure to see you again. Likewise. It's always nice to see you. And I remember the old days with great fondness. Yeah. It, was a, it was a good time back then. It's a different time now, but just as exciting. Always good to meet old friends again. Likewise. Okay. Good to see you, Elena. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. It was such a pleasure to see you again and to sit down and have a chat about marine insurance, which we both know quite a lot about. I worked as a marine insurance broker for 10 years and then as a hull and machinery underwriter for 10 years. So you could say that we know what we're talking about. Since the last episode, I started a new podcast, another one. Well, I didn't, but together with a colleague of mine, also a friend, Per Olof Arnes, who started a podcast about how to podcast. It's in Swedish, so I'm sorry if you don't understand Swedish, you will probably not be able to listen to it. But it's good fun. We're testing things. Testing the things that everyone is talking about. How to podcast and how to make interviews via the internet. And yeah, lots of different things. So it's... Uh, all over again, new things, new stuff. And um, I think that the end goal with that podcast is that if you want to start a podcast or if you are thinking about it, please let us know and we can help you. We have learned a few tricks the last three years that we have both been podcasting. Pio is doing a podcast about logistics, so it's not that far away even though I keep telling him that shipping is much more important. <laughs> He's now going to make an English podcast. I think he was smitten by me, in a way. It's possible to get a bigger audience if you have a podcast in English. This podcast is downloaded in 166 countries around the world. I think that is so amazing, and it makes me humble. I never thought this would be... Such a big thing when I started. It's about 5,000 people every month that is downloading what I am talking about in my closet. I mean, unbelievable. I will continue to do this. I promise. I got so many emails and shout outs that I can't stop now just because I'm approaching 100 episodes. I will read you a shout out because people get so very happy to hear that I am reading what they are writing to me. I read everything and I try to answer as well. So this one came from Ivan Flores in Hamburg. Dear Lena, I just heard the shipping podcast episode with Sinetha, CEO, and I thought it was a wonderful conversation. Great listen and I really appreciate your work. Hope that you keep on rocking. Best regards from Hamburg. Thank you, Ivan. I will. I promise you. I think I got new energy now. When I understand that there are so many people that appreciate what I do. Unfortunately, I can't say the same for the industry who doesn't really think or understand why they should try and do some marketing via a podcast or work with me to do that. But it's their loss. I think that I am onto something, and I know that you know that I'm onto something. There are a few episodes left from my visit to Oslo in October, but I promise you I have made more interviews after that. So there is more in the pipeline. Now I have to leave you. I am attending the Opening Oceans Conference in Copenhagen this week. And of course, I'm doing some interviews there as well, but uh, I have to leave you now. So, from me to you, over and out. Thank you for listening to The Shipping Podcast. Don't forget to tell everyone that you meet that there is a shipping podcast available and that they should download it and listen to the maritime professionals who are sharing their passion for the shipping industry. 